All right, John chapter 10. Let's get, dig right into the chapter here. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And uh, skip down to verse number 10 real quick, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on this point uh, just for a few minutes. Verse 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, the reason why I'm focusing on this is notice in that first verse he says, He that entereth not by the door. So someone who's not coming in the front door, Jesus is saying, if they kind of climb up some other way, they're a thief, they're a robber. And what is the intent of a thief or a robber? In verse 10 it says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. This is one of the areas in Scripture that, that I believe us as Christians can use as a justification for defending yourself in your house. So if someone were to break in your house in the middle of the night, and they're climbing through a window. You know, they're climbing over your fence. They're breaking in some other way. They're not just coming in the front door. You know, they're not just welcome, you know, coming right in the front door because they own the place. Their intent, I think it's, it's very easy to be understood that you don't know exactly what their intent is, but according to the Bible, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And if they're not coming in through their front door, obviously, like, they belong, to, they're supposed to be coming in here. I don't mean that they're busting down your door and, well, hey, they use the front door. But if they're coming in some other way, look, the thief comes through, but to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's why I believe we're justified as Christians to be able to defend yourself. So if you were to shoot somebody that's breaking into your house in the middle of the night, you don't know what their intent is, but it's, you are definitely um, obligated to be able to defend yourself and defend your family from this type of evil that comes in. And we can see the intent here and you not knowing exactly what that intent might be. But the Bible says right here that one of the intents could be to kill. And you don't know that. And if someone comes in, it's the middle of the night, they're breaking through, then I believe that we're justified in killing. And a lot of people have this, this definition incorrect in the Bible because the Bible says thou shalt not kill. Right? It's one of the Ten Commandments. And I've heard people say, well, then they take this to an extreme of saying that, well, we should all just be pacifists then and you should just let everything happen. Like, you can't defend yourself. You can't kill anybody under any circumstances. Well, that's ridiculous because they're not understanding when the Bible says kill, it doesn't just mean to take another person's life. Killing, what, we're, what we commonly call killing in the Bible is murdering. There's a difference between putting someone to death and killing in the Bible, when you, when you look in the context of Scripture. Because if you think about it, it wouldn't make sense even within the law of the Bible itself. How many, how many laws are there with the punishment is the death penalty, right? It says they shall stone them with stones. Well, if it meant that we can never put another human being to death, that thou shalt not kill, it, it would be a contradiction inherent to God's own law. Obviously, that word kill doesn't mean just taking another person's life. It means murdering. Now, if you're defending yourself and, and someone lies in wait and someone is trying to harm you and trying to harm your family, you are justified biblically to, to defend yourself even if it means taking another person's life. And I believe that. And that's not a major point in the sermon. I just wanted to point that out because this is a section that can show you that intent of someone who's breaking into your house straight out of the Bible that they come through not but for to steal and kill and destroy. That's where the thief comes into your house, those that are coming in some other way. But let's make the, um, that's kind of a, a, a secondary application of this verse. Let's look at the primary, what Jesus is talking about, because first he gives this parable. First he gives this parable about, um, he says, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. So the, and it says, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. This is a parable talking about a shepherd. 
a shepherd that watches over a flock of sheep. He's responsible for the sheep. He spends a lot of time with the sheep. If you remember, you know, like David, they'd be out in the fields while they're eating and they would spend and literally like sleep out there and stay with the sheep for days on end or for however long it takes and, until maybe someone else comes and relieves them or whatever. Um, in many places in the Bible, you'll see that a shepherd's job, they're always out, they're always with the sheep. The sheep know them. The sheep um, follow them. It's, it's real easy to get sheep to follow. That's why today, you know, people are called sheeple because they just follow whatever they're taught. They, they, they just believe whatever they're told. They watch the TV and if the news says something's true, then that's the truth. Or, if, you know, if you learn something in school, then that's just the way it is. And that's why people have this, this um, are called sheeple. It's a derogatory name, obviously, but it's, it's founded in truth in the sense that sheep aren't very smart creatures. They're led very easily. They have, they have um, one leader that, they, that guides them and directs them. And Jesus is using the, the sheep as an example that, hey, the shepherd, the sheep are going to listen and follow the shepherd's voice, but they don't just listen to anybody. That's why it says in verse number five, it says, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him for they know not the voice of strangers. So if someone were to come up on this flock of sheep and were just to say, okay, you know, come on, follow me and just give them commands, like they're not all just going to go start following anybody that comes. They follow their shepherd. They follow who they know and who they're comfortable with and who they've come to, to realize is their leader. They're not just going to go and listen to anyone. That's why it's not so easy just to go and just, just steal a flock of sheep because they'll all just follow you no matter who comes up to them. He says, a stranger will they not follow. They know not that voice. That voice is going to sound foreign to them. They're actually going to run away from them because they don't know them. They think that the stranger is going to do them harm. But the, sh the good shepherd that watches over and protects the sheep, the sheep know his voice. Then the sheep are going to be able to take care of them. Now, it says in verse 6, this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. So that's the parable. He's just explaining that they're sheep, they hear the voice of the shepherd, and the stranger that they're not going to follow, they're going to run away from him because they know the shepherd's voice. And the shepherd comes in through the door. He does, he's not a thief. He's not a robber. Um, he's in his proper place. And they didn't understand what the parable meant, why he's telling them this story. They're just like, yeah, we know what sheep do. You know, it's probably common knowledge, but he goes in in verse 7 then to explain unto them, expound unto them what this parable actually means. Um, verse number 7 says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robber, robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not. Seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Um, Verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I'm going to get into the rest of this a little later. I kind of covered a lot of this. But he's explaining that he is that good shepherd, right? So in his parable, Jesus Christ, he's, he says he's the door. And he also says that he's the shepherd. So there's two different applications that we're going to make here. One of him just being the door and showing how easy salvation is, right? The salvation is, is as easy as just walking through that door. He says that um, in verse 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. He says, if you come through me, if you go through Jesus Christ, you could go in and out, you'll find pasture, and you're saved. And that's why, you know, again, showing that Jesus Christ is the only way through salvation because if you're trying to get in any other way, he says you're going through, you know, you're a thief or you're a robber or you're, tr or you're trying to follow a thief or a robber that's going some other way. Jesus Christ says, I am the door and saying that he is the only way 
to get in. He is the only way to be saved. You have to go through that door of Jesus Christ to be saved. There is no other way. You can't work your way around. You can't build yourself a ladder to get in. You can't do anything else in order to be saved. You have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. It has to be through Jesus Christ. It's not through Muhammad. It's not through Buddha. It's not through any of these other false religions. It's through Jesus Christ alone. He is that door. He is the only way. It's the right way. It's the narrow way. It's the only way. Um, that's one application he's saying here when he's saying that he is the door. And it's kind of interesting, too, because it says they could go in and out. And people will say, oh, what well, if you turn your back on Jesus? Well, you're saved. You could go in and out. You could find pasture. You know, you could, you could, you could go in through him. As long as it's through Jesus and you've done that, then you're saved. But um, the other thing I'll point out here is it says he's the shepherd. And when he says that the sheep hear his voice... He gave that parable that, that um, the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd. Now, Jesus Christ said that he was the shepherd. So this isn't just talking about a pastor of a church, right? I, won't make that, I don't make that application here, and I'm going to get into that a little bit too, but Jesus Christ is the shepherd. The words of Jesus Christ are found in this book, are they not? This is the word of God and the words of Jesus. Jesus is that good shepherd, and he says that his sheep, so in order to be his sheep, you got, obviously you have to be saved. You're not going to be a goat. The Bible refers to sheep and goats, and um, those that are saved and those that are unsaved. If you are one of his sheep, he says you will hear his voice. So, God's word right here, this, this is why the King James Bible is so important that you have the proper word of God. It's kind of a... Um, I, I like to use this example or use this test, so to speak, in, in trying to gauge if a person is truly saved or not. Now, obviously, what I think about a person's salvation doesn't matter in the end. Uh, you know, I have no bearing on whether or not that person is saved or not. They either are or they aren't. God knows their heart. But it is important for us to look at people and try to, try to gauge if they are saved because the last thing you want to do is to assume that somebody's saved and you have opportunities to give that person the gospel. You could preach the truth unto them, but because you just assume that they're saved, you don't do that because you have this false sense of security. Oh yeah, well that person's already saved. So what I use with this is, is a way to determine, do we need to, do I need to give that person the gospel again? Do I think that they're saved? Um, it's not to look down on them or, or to, to cause strifes or problems with people. But what I'm getting at here is, is Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice. When you get saved and you have the Holy Spirit, you could, under, you could start to understand the Bible. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to understand every single thing perfectly, but you're going to hear His voice. His voice is the one that you should recognize as being the voice of God, as being the voice of the shepherd, as being the voice of Jesus. I believe that saved people ought to be able to identify when you start lining up these, these perversions of the Bible and then you have the King James Bible, when you start to read them and you, you honestly look at it and you're trying to hear that voice, if you're saved, you should hear the voice of the shepherd. You should be able to recognize, you know what, yeah, this is his voice. And it's one of the things that, that it's hard, you can't really like quantify it or put a test on it, but people who just say, Here's one good example. If someone just says, like, I tried reading the King James Bible, I just don't understand it at all. I just don't know what it's saying. Right there, a huge red flag. That person's probably not saved because they're not hearing the voice of the shepherd. It's not that difficult. I remember, and I know because I got saved when I was 20, and I tried reading the Bible prior to getting saved, and it made no sense to me. I would say the same exact thing. I'd be like, pfft. I have no idea what this is talking about. I try to make sense on it, but it's because you have blinders over your eyes. You have the veil over your face when you're trying to read. You're trying to understand Scripture. You just can't do it. You don't have the light of Jesus Christ inside of you to illuminate His Word and to understand it completely. So when someone says, you know, I just don't get it. I just don't understand. I try to read. I don't get it at all. 
big red flag that that person's probably not not saved. And again, I use I use this parable and his reference to him being the shepherd and his sheep hearing his voice. And then he says another they will not follow. So when we think of another voice of a shepherd that's not Jesus Christ, that would be the words of Jesus. I mean, one application would be his word, which is in the Bible. So if you if you have another book and someone says, well, I just I understand the NIV way more than I understand the King James Bible. And it makes a lot more sense to me. They're following another voice. Jesus said that your sheep is not, are not going to follow the voice of a stranger. That is the voice of a stranger. That's the voice of man. That's the voice of Satan who has perverted God's word. Jesus Christ is the word. He is the good shepherd. When we take other words that did not come from Jesus Christ, that's the voice of a stranger. Now, the other thing obviously would be a different savior. So people who are, who are looking to a different, a different savior like a Mohammed or like some other false religion, a saved person isn't going to get caught up into that. A saved person is going to hear the voice of Jesus. They're not going to follow the voice of a stranger. So you're not going to say to someone like, oh, well, this person got saved and now they've, turned in, now they've converted into to a Muslim. It's not going to happen. Not if, they, not if they truly put their faith in Jesus Christ because they're not going to follow the voice of a stranger. They're not going to be deceived and, and follow that voice. It just, it just simply won't happen. It's one of those things that, that once you're saved, I believe it's just, it's just not going to happen by virtue of being saved and having the Holy Spirit inside of you. The same way in Matthew 24, it explains that in the, in the end times how believers, the elect, will not be deceived by the Antichrist it says um, in verse 24 of Matthew 24, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Showing right here, it's not possible that the false Christs, the false prophets, no matter how many signs and wonders they do, they will not deceive the very elect, which goes hand in hand exactly with what we're talking about here, with what Jesus Christ said, that his sheep hear his voice and a stranger they will not follow. Now, you don't have to understand all of the reasoning behind that. Well, I thought we have free will. How is that going to happen? Look, it's what the Bible says. Jesus says it's, you, you, won't, you won't be deceived. My sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. And I mean, it makes sense because there would be no, there would be no reason once you have the truth, once you know the truth, there is no reason for you to follow a lie or to follow a false Christ, an antichrist. Um, it just, it just wouldn't make any sense once you already have that knowledge. Even having the free will to do so, you just won't do it. Um, I believe that's what the Bible teaches and, and the, these two passages go hand in hand. John 10, this parable of the sheep along with Matthew 24, 24. Um, now I want to get on this subject of a hireling. We saw that, I started to read a little bit, verse number 12. And again, this is Jesus Christ comparing himself as the good shepherd to someone who is hired to watch the sheep. Someone who's just paid the sheep aren't theirs. They belong to someone else. They're just there. It's their job. And they're there to do a job. And, um, and he says here, it says, verse 12, But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Now, basically what he's saying here, you think about someone, I don't know if any of you have ever worked a security job or something like that. You know, you get hired on for some business. It's not your family business. It's not, not anything like directly related to you. It's just a job, right? Most people, if you're at a job and someone comes in to rob the place or whatever, you're not going to put up a fight. You're just going to be like, okay, well, whatever, because ultimately you don't really care about the stuff you're protecting. I mean, you're there, you're going to do your job, you're going to do the best of your job, but at the end of the day, 
You know, if you don't care about, about that stuff, it doesn't belong to you. Like the, the cash in the register at McDonald's, someone goes in to steal money, you know, you're not gonna be fighting nearly as much as if someone were maybe to come and, and rob you, and rob you of your life savings or, or whatever. You're a lot more likely to care a lot more about your own stuff and do more about it because you care more about it than if it's somebody else's. This is what Jesus is saying. That's why he's saying, look, I am the good shepherd. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. The sheep belong unto me. They belong unto Jesus Christ. So he's saying a hireling, yeah, they're going to run away. They're going to flee. When that wolf comes, the sheep are not theirs. They're just getting paid to watch over them. Hey, when danger comes, they're not going to risk their neck to save somebody else's sheep, they'll just run away and they'll just, they'll flee from the harm. But Jesus is saying that, no, he's like, I will, I will be there. I'm there to protect you. I am the good shepherd. I'm not going to let that happen. You belong unto me. This is what he's saying about the hireling. And what, there's a common teaching out there today. I don't know how common it is, really. I don't know how much ground it is. It seems to be gaining more and more ground. And it stems from this house church movement. Don't ever get sucked into this house church movement. Now, when I say the house church movement, I don't mean like we have a church that's meeting in a house. We're a Baptist church. We're meeting in a house. We're just getting things started. The church is the congregation. It's not about where you meet. Where you meet is... is unimportant. Yet there's this house church movement who believes the only way you should have church is in a house. As soon as you meet in a building, as soon as you do anything else, oh, you are not a scriptural church. That is a lie. That is false. And these same people, they speak out of both sides of their mouth because they'll tell you, oh yeah, church is a congregation. It's the people. Then why do you care so much about a meeting in a house? Why do you care if a church is meeting in a building somewhere? And they'll use these arguments to build straw man arguments and they'll say things like, um, you know, well, the Bible doesn't say that you need to go get a loan in order to have a building. Well, you're right. The Bible doesn't say that. And just because, you know, I agree that we shouldn't be getting into debt either and shouldn't be getting loans to pay for some building. I don't think we should be doing that. I don't think that's scriptural. But it doesn't mean that we can't ever have a location or ever build a building and ever be able to fund things as a church to have a location where we can all meet together as the church grows which is only going to be natural to have normal church growth and to expand out of a meeting place. Like right now, we could fit, you know, maybe 50 people in here. I'm not sure exactly. I forgot what the number is exactly. But we could, we could we'd be able to fit 50 people in here. Fine, but we want this church to grow. And you think about the churches in the days of the apostles, they were growing by leaps and bounds. I mean, by thousands of people were being added to the church daily. I mean, there was people getting saved left and right and people becoming part of that church. Hey, I'm, I hate to burst your bubble, but a house church is not going to be able to handle that many people. And if these people really do believe that the building isn't the church, then what is the big deal? What does it really matter? We could be meeting outside under a tree. We could be meeting in a strip mall. We could be meeting in a bigger building. We could be meeting in a house. It doesn't matter. But what these people also don't like, this house church movement, they'll, again, they'll claim to believe in elders, but they don't believe in a pastor or somehow. I don't, I don't know how they're, they jump through the logic of that. But they don't believe that a pastor should be paid is what it boils down to. They'll say like, well, the person leading the church, or the, the, the elder, if you want to call him an elder, a scriptural term, a bishop, an elder, they shouldn't be paid. They should be like everybody else, they should not receive a paycheck. And if they do, they call him a hireling. And they'll point to this verse right here to justify and say, see, look how bad a hireling is. Now, throughout the entire Bible, I looked up every reference of hireling. This is really the only place that you could find a real negative connotation. Most of the time when the Bible talks about hireling, it's just talking about a person who has a job. Because you're hired to do something. And if you're going to try to apply this, this passage to a pastor that gets paid, you're not applying it correctly. Because Jesus Christ is comparing himself as the good shepherd to, to an hireling. So would you say that um, what's the alternative then? 
if you're a pastor, well, well, I can't be a hireling, so what am I? The good shepherd? No. Is the elder of the church the good shepherd? No, that's Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ is the head of this church, whether or not the pastor gets paid, whether or not they, the, the elder gets paid for, for doing the work that he's doing. And I'm going to show you, we're going to go to a few, uh, few references here about, um, about the pastor being paid. Let's turn, if you would, to, um, to Luke chapter 10, verse number 7. Luke chapter 10, verse number 7. The Bible says, And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. This is his commandment. To, um, to his disciples when they were going out and they were preaching the gospel, okay? He would say, you know, when you go out, just stay at the same house. Don't be going from different people's house. Once you get into the city, stay at that house, eat and drink such things as they give. Now look, I know this isn't talking about a pastor, necessarily. It could be, but, but, it's, but it's not specifically talking about that role. But what they say, the laborer is worthy of his hire. So if the laborer is worthy of his hire... Would, shouldn't a good elder be, be laboring? Wouldn't a good pastor be working hard and laboring? Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter number 5, because we're going to see that. If the laborer is worthy of his hire, oh, all of a sudden you're a hireling. So are you just going to call? I, I wonder why they don't use this term to the people who it actually applies to. These people who are going out and preaching the gospel. Jesus Christ's disciples went out, they preached the gospel. And they were fed food. They were completely taken care of when they were out in these places. And he says, hey, you're, it's worthy of the hire that you're receiving. They were receiving their hire for the work that they were doing. Oh, they're hirelings. Oh, yeah. They're, see, they don't care about the sheep. They're hirelings. Do you see how they misapply this? Because they're not going to call these people hirelings even though they're getting hired. Even though that's a, that's a much more accurate definition of the word. Hey, you're being hired. You're getting paid. You're a hireling. You can't just automatically make that jump in this story in John 10 to just say, oh, well, because you're a hireling now, you don't care about the sheep. You don't care about the flock. And that's what they'll say. They'll say, a pastor that gets paid doesn't care about the congregation because all they care about is the money. And they'll try to use these verses to deceive you. And it's, it's inaccurate. It's in true. It's untrue. It's, it's, it's actually an insult. Now look, does the Bible talk about people who, who preach for the love of money and the love of money is the root of all evil? Absolutely. And if a, if a preacher is going to change his message and going to twist the scripture or not preach the word of God because he's afraid about the money that's going to come in, that is wickedness and that's a sin. If he thinks that people are going to pull his paycheck <laughs> excuse me, and not pay him because of what he's preaching? Yes, that is a sin and that's wrong. But to say that any pastor who receives money based on the work that they're doing, based on, on the, the labor that they're putting forth into the church and into the people and into God's work, to assume and to just jump to that conclusion that all of a sudden now that preacher is, is, is only doing it, is only in it for the money, is false. That is that is that is an inaccurate claim, and it's and it's wickedness. And what people end up doing is becoming false accusers of good men of God and going to these scripture references that are talking about people who only preach because of the money, who preach for filthy lucre's sake. See what they're what they're failing to understand is what is the motivation. The motivation for for myself and I, I'm not getting currently getting paid, but I'll tell you what I am going to get paid by this church. My goal is to be able to ultimately not have to work the job that I'm working right now and be able to, to work and focus all of my attention completely on the things of God and on this church and on soul winning and on doing all of the work that I could possibly doing to the extent of the, of the energy and the time that I have. I want to free up that time of, being able, of having to support my family by being supported by the church to, to be 100% all of my time in the ministry. 
And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Now, if my motivation was, you know what? I want an easy job. I just want to sit back. I don't want to work hard. I want to just get a job where I can just preach a few times and I'm going to be making a bunch of money and we're really going to build this church up and I'm going to get people in here and we're going to make a lot of money. That would be wicked. That is definitely wrong. And that is what, and that is what most of those scriptures that, that these people even turn to are talking about. But to apply those scriptures to a man of God who's going out and doesn't care about the money, but is going out and has a family to support and is, and is trying to do all the work that God has set before him, to use those scriptures against a, a preacher like that, an elder like that, is just is completely wrong and it's false accusations. Because what it turns into then is, is an accusation of, the, of that pastor's heart being only in it for the money and not caring about the flock. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 5. Look at verse number 16. It says, and this is talking about the church. This whole, in context of 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 16 says, If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So is the church responsible for, for financially supporting widows? Absolutely. Those that are widows indeed. The church is charged with taking care of them and supporting them. That is one thing that the church is supposed to do. Let's look at verse number 17. This is all in context of the same thing. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now that word honor doesn't always just mean respect. We saw um, when you look at the application of the Ten Commandments, honor thy father and thy mother. Well, if you remember when Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees, they said that um, it is Corban, that is a gift, whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And talking about a Pharisee not taking care of his parents and then say, oh, well, instead of it being his duty and his obligation, his responsibility to honor his father's mother, to take care of his parents. If he says, well, whatever you get from me, just consider that a gift. Jesus Christ said you've made the law of none effect. Their responsibility is to take care of them and it's to honor them. So honoring isn't just talking about respect. It's also talking about taking care of it. It depends on the context, how the word is used. So how do we know that when it says, let the elders that rule well be worthy of double honor, how do we know what this is talking about here? Well, let's keep reading. Look at verse number 18. For the scripture saith, why should the elder receive double honor, especially that labor in the word of doctrine? Because, for the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. This is talking about the elder of the church. And another word for elder is the pastor or the bishop. That elder is worthy of double honor. If they're doing the work, if they're working hard, if they're laboring in the word, if they're doing all this stuff, hey, that laborer is worthy of his reward. Don't muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. That means, you know, the ox that does all, and that what this is talking about, the ox muzzling, you know, not muzzling the ox that treadeth out the corn. They would use these animals to grind their corn, to make the powder so they could make, you know, cornmeal and things like that. They would have the animal go and do that and say, well, look, the animal's doing all of this work. And you shouldn't muzzle it and not allow the animal to at least be able to eat some of the fruits of what it's doing, of, of, the, of the job that it's doing. Allow it to eat. And he explains later, he says, you know, does God care for oxen? He's like, why did God even tell us this, not to muzzle the ox? Was it for our sakes or because of the ox sakes? God doesn't care about the ox. You know, it's not that the ox is so important. He says he wrote it for our sakes. Because he cares about men. And, and, and when, a, when a man of God is laboring and doing the work, you shouldn't muzzle that ox. I mean, hey, pay him. And, and someone that does well, they're worthy of double honor. Take care of them. And it doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to be like, like these, these uh, prosperity preachers. They're driving their, their BMWs and they're living in these mansions and everything else. Look, the, they're false prophets and they are in it for the money and that's all they care. The Joel Osteens of this world, they are the ones that the Bible is talking about, about um, preaching for filthy lucre's sake. But the man of God, the elder that's doing what's right, 
that's, that's preaching what's right. Hey, you should be able to tell whether or not a preacher is holding back in, from the Word of God based on the things that he says. You, can, you should be able to, dis, to discern, unless you're a, a spiritual newborn, you should be able to discern whether or not that preacher is preaching for filthy lucre's sake or if he's just preaching the truth out of the Word of God. That should be pretty apparent and pretty obvious to see. And to apply that scripture that talks about preaching for filthy lucre's sake to a man of God who's doing what's right is, is a dishonor um, and, is, and is not right. Turn if you want to Acts chapter 6. We'll see one more place about this. Acts chapter 6. Jesus Christ, remember, with, with the apostle Peter, Peter was an elder. John was an elder. He told, Jesus Christ told them that you are not going to be fishermen anymore. Yet the house church movement claims that the elder needs to have, a, a, if they need to support their family, if they're not independently wealthy, then they ought to work just like anyone else. And they should not be supported by the church at all. Jesus Christ told the Apostle Peter, James, John, all those disciples, he says, look, you're not going to be fishermen anymore. That was their trade. If they were going to support themselves, their families, Peter had a wife. He had a mother-in-law. He had people to take care of. If he had to do anything to support his family, what do you think he's going to do? He's going to be a fisherman. Well, now all of a sudden, Jesus took that out of the equation because he said, you're not going to be, you're not going to be a fisherman. You're going to fish for men. He said, no longer are there going to be fishermen. So the people now in the church movement just think that, well, he must have just got another job. That's found nowhere in Scripture. And in fact, if you're in Acts chapter 6, we're going to start reading in verse number 1. We're going to see exactly what they did say. It says, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. So the church is growing. It's abounding. There's more disciples. The church is growing. It says, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So now the church is starting to feel the growing pains of having so many people in the church because one of the obligations of the church was to take care of the widows, to go and help them out, to support them, to to. to to help them however they need help to support those widows. And some of the Greeks, their, their widows were being neglected as a daily task, a daily ministering. Now, how big would the church have to be for people to start grumbling and murmuring because their widows, plural, were, were neglected in the daily ministration? Now, just think about it. I mean, in an average church, you've got all different ages of people. You're going to have young families, old families, old elderly people, you know, ranging in, 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 a, in a normal, healthy-sized church. You're going to have, you should have a full spectrum. Well, obviously, this church had a lot of people in it because they were complaining about some of the widows not getting taken care of properly. I mean, we're talking a huge church here to have that many widows. I mean, we don't have any any widows that we need to take care of in our church. Obviously, we're real small, but other churches I've been in too, I mean, you might have like one or two people that would fall into that category of being a widow. And these are, these are people that must be widows indeed, that don't have other family members. Think about that. I mean, just because someone's a widow doesn't mean they don't have other family members that take care of them. A widow indeed, according to the Bible, is someone who's got no one to take care of them. They've got nobody else to take care of them. That's why the church takes care of them. This is a pretty big church that we're talking about. They're not meeting in one person's house. Let's keep reading, though. Verse number two. It says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. They're saying our job, there's so much to do in church. Hey, our job is going to be continually to prayer and ministry of the word. They're going to preach. They're going to preach the gospel. They're going to be praying. This is what we're going to do continually. In order to do that continually, they're not going to be, if they're worried about not being able to take care of these widows, it's because they're doing the prayer and the ministry of the word. It's not because, oh, well, we have to go to our other secular job in order to support our families. Nowhere in the Bible do you see that, that it's a requirement. If you're going to support your families, then you have to get another job. 
And if you're going to be the elder of the church, you cannot be supported by the church. Ridiculous, heresy, false doctrine. Don't get sucked into this house church movement and their lies. But let's keep reading here in the chapter. He said in uh, verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep and other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And I've heard some crazy things with just this one verse. People like to tell you that you're like, oh, what's the other fold? Maybe it's aliens. You know, maybe aliens are real and this is the other fold of sheep that Jesus has he has to bring to him. Look, all he's talking about here is the Gentiles. It's, it's, it's the Jews were the fold, the, you know, his elect, the original chosen people of God. But there's the other fold is, is basically everybody else that was not part of that original group of God's chosen people that um, he says, them also must I bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. We're all in one fold today, whether you're Jew, Gentile, you know, bond or free, male or female, there's one shepherd and we're in one fold. Verse number 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. And, um, you know, I know that, that marching to Zion is going to be a, a great, a great documentary and I can't wait for it to come out but it's already ruffling people's feathers you know these Zionists that just that just love to support Israel without fail regardless of the fact that they're an antichrist nation and that they reject the Lord Jesus Christ and they will have nothing to do with God the Father or God the Son these people just want to cling to their false doctrine that they've been taught for who knows how long that you have to support Israel and it's funny because I, I saw a comment recently where some guy, I don't even know this guy, he, he, um, he was quoting this verse where, he said, where Jesus Christ says, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. So because Jesus Christ said that he's basically laying down his life, he said, look, no one could take my life from me. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again, right? So he's saying, I'm offering, my, and, and this is true and this is important. We can't overlook this because Jesus Christ was making an important sacrifice. He had the power at any time. That's what he said to Pilate, you know, that um, he had the power to, to call, to ask his father and he would receive, you know, legions of angels can just come at any moment and just protect him. He didn't have to be killed. He didn't have to for himself, like, like, like he, or, or speaking for himself. He had to do it to save the world, but he didn't have to do it other than that. So at no point was he worried about being in danger of somebody by chance, you know, taking his life like against his will. Is basically what he's saying. When someone, when, when Judas betrayed him, it was not against the will of Jesus Christ. He was willingly giving up his life. And what I heard this person say is that, see, so I don't understand why anyone can, can say that a, a person or a group of people killed Jesus. It's like, what? But they want to cling, they want to love Israel so much that they cannot fathom, they cannot bear to hear when somebody tells you the truth that the Jews killed Jesus Christ, that they were antichrist, they did not believe he was a Christ. By and large, obviously, I'm not speaking 100% of all the people. He says, no man taketh it from me. So um, what I did, I actually respond. I don't normally, I don't like getting in debates on Facebook. I think it's stupid. I think it's fruitless. I, I, I really try to stay away from that. It's a big waste of time. I don't try to argue with people online. I've done it before and it's dumb. In order to, if you really do want to convince somebody, I recommend having a conversation with that person where you can have a dialogue back and forth. 
You start typing things. It doesn't always sound the way that you say it. People get offended easily. And then you get off on all these, these rabbit trails and all these different points are brought up. It just seems to me to be a big waste of time. But anyways, I just felt like, okay, well, I'm just going to throw this out there because the guy's a Christian. As far as I could tell, I mean, he's, he, he's a, you know, a, a Christian man. I, I don't know much about, like I said, I, I, I don't even care, but like, I just threw out this verse because he's like, I don't understand how, I, I don't understand how anyone can say that some group of people killed Jesus. And I just said, well, maybe here is how somebody can say that. And I, and I wrote, I um, copied and pasted 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse 14 says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, colon, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men. Maybe that's how someone can say that a group of people killed Jesus because the Bible flat out says that the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Just because Jesus has the power to lay down his own life, just because he allowed it to happen does not mean that the other people have no responsibility for actually killing him and taking his life. It's stupidity. And, and it's this, this wanting to cling so much to love Israel no matter what. Look, the Jews killed Jesus. Get over it. They did it. You don't have to defend them. The Bible says that they did it. Okay? They rejected him. Now, it doesn't change the way you treat people today. It doesn't change the way you treat a Jew today. You still give them the gospel and love them and try to get them saved, just like you would anybody else. But the fact of the matter remains, yes, Jesus had the power to, to allow himself to be killed and to give up his life, but the other people aren't guiltless. That's what he said to, to, to Pilate, that um, he that delivered me unto you at the greater sin. Judas had the greater sin than even Pilate did, but Judas had a great sin. He, reject, he denied the Lord Jesus. He rejected him, and he betrayed him. And he had the sin. He, was, he betrayed Jesus, and that's, that's a fact. Just as much as a fact that it were the Jews that were saying, crucify him, crucify him, and his blood shall be upon us and on our children. Yeah, our children said, you know, he's, it's, they're responsible. They did it. But um, this verse doesn't negate that at all. And the way that he was, is interpreting this verse just automatically just, there's a contradiction in the Bible if you're going to interpret it that way. You cannot interpret it that way. That's not even what it's saying and what he means. He's just saying, look, I've got the power to lay down my life and I've got the power to take it up again. He offered up himself as a sacrifice. He was killed by the Jews, no matter what anybody says. And, but the reason he was is because he allowed that to happen. It doesn't mean he killed himself because they have no responsibility. Well, it's like he killed himself then because he laid out his life. No, he allowed it to happen. Anyways, let's move on from that point. Verse number 19 says, There was a division therefore again among the Jews for these sayings, and many of them said, He hath a devil and is mad. Why hear him? Again, we see these people just saying that Jesus Christ had a devil, blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Verse 21 says, Others said, These are not the words of him that hath the devil. And think about this. Now what Jesus is saying here, he's giving them a parable about being the good shepherd and the sheep hear his voice. And he says, I'm the door. If anyone comes in through me, they're, you know. Is that really what a, a person who's demon-possessed is going to be saying? I don't think so. Um, but they're just saying that. And that's why these other people are saying, like, these are not the words of him that hath the devil. And then they say, can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Devils don't do the miracles that Jesus was doing either. Verse 22, And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. And didn't we see that already, like in the book of John? How many times did Jesus Christ, he claimed to be God in the flesh, he claimed to be the Christ? He already has said it plainly. He's saying, look, I've already said it and you didn't believe me. So why do you keep asking? It's like, it's like the Pharisees that were asking the blind man last week how he received his sight. Like, but how did he do it? You know, how, he's like, look, 
Are you going to be his disciples too? I already told you how we did it. They just, they just, they don't believe it and they don't want to believe it, but they keep asking the question. I told you and believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. They can't hear him. They, they don't hear the voice of the shepherd because they're not of his sheep. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. What a great, again, great verses for eternal security to show somebody. Because people like to ask you this. They'll say, um, my, the people might say, oh, well, if you commit suicide, you know, you... you um, you're not saved anymore, or they come up with some reasons on how you can no longer be saved. But Jesus says here, he says, I give unto them eternal life. Obviously, eternal means forever. And they shall never perish. And it's important that these are coming from the words of Jesus Christ. These are coming out of the mouth of Jesus. So if something were to happen where someone who believes, one of Jesus' sheep, who has come in through the door, through Jesus Christ, if they were to perish after Jesus Christ said they shall never perish, that makes Jesus Christ a liar. So Jesus Christ is either a liar or he's telling the truth. If he's telling the truth, then you're never gonna, you're, you truly never are going to die. And he says, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So people like to say, oh, well, you could turn your back on God. People like to say, like the free will Baptist will say, well, you have the free will to get saved because it's just, you know, whosoever will may come, you could, you could get saved. But you also have the free will to turn your back on God and to give up your salvation. Well, let me ask you this. If he says, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Once you're in the hand of Jesus Christ, can any man pluck you out of his hand? No. Well, are you a man? I don't mean you. I mean mankind in general. Right? Are you a man? You're a man, woman, right? If you're a man, you can't pluck yourself out of Jesus Christ's hand either. Does that make sense? I mean, he's saying, no man shall pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. God, God is greater than everybody. Nobody can change your eternal destination. Once you're saved, you have eternal life. You're saved forever. And he says, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. He says, I and my Father are one. And this is what really got them upset. Verse 31 says, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou being a man makest thyself God. So they were really upset that the fact that he was making himself God, because it's true. If he says, I and my Father are one, he's basically saying that he's God, right? But, um, and, and he's done that time and time again when he says he's the son of God. They, they still, he's, they, they hated him. They wanted to kill him because he made himself equal with God. Now, um, there's this last section I want to focus on. I'm going to spend the rest of the sermon on this one point. Let's keep reading here. He says, um, verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, because I said, I am the Son of God. This is kind of a it's kind of a strange answer from Jesus. And admittedly, I think it's one that kind of causes a lot of confusion. It's not easy to be understood. At least um, it wasn't for me. But I'm going to teach you what I believe this means. And I'm pretty confident about this. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't really be preaching about it. But turn, let's look at the passage that he's referring to. It's in um, Psalm 82. I'm really not going off my notes at all tonight. So that's why I need to see where I'm at here. Yeah, I totally skipped the, the Trinity reference. But, um, but that's okay. When he says, I and my Father are one, obviously it's referring to uh, you can look up 1 John chapter 5, famous verse, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. And John 1.1 1, 1 explains that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, 
Trinity references, but um, Psalm 82 is where he's quoting this. When Jesus said, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods. So this, this is what he's referring to is in Psalm 82, and we'll read the whole psalm. This is what he's quoting. When he's saying, look, isn't it written, I said, ye are gods, but I'm saying I'm the son of God, so why are you going about to kill me? Um, It, Psalm 82, let's look at verse number 1. The Bible says, the Bible reads, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. So, let's just, we're going to get to the, to the point a little bit later, but um, to the exact quote. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. So the gathering of mighty men, right? He's talking about mighty men. He judgeth among the gods. Here we see a reference to men being gods. Now it's always lowercase g. Anytime you look in the Bible, this is very important to understand. And you could do your own Bible study on this. Look up all the time. It's a lot. I found a lot. But every time the word low, the lowercase g, g gods is being used. It's not talking about a deity. If it's talking about a deity at all, it's a false deity. So when God, even though we know they're not real, and I'm going to get to that, we'll go, we'll go to a scripture that says that, that it's clearly like the, the idols that people made, the graven images, right? People might fall down and worship that grave, graven image, and they'll fall down before it, but it's not a god. It's not a deity. All it really is is just a piece of wood covered with metal. That's all it is. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a piece of matter. It's not, it's not anything more than that. But it's still referred, they're still referred to as gods in the Bible. You know, even scripture will refer to them as gods. Now, that's with the understanding that it's not really gods, but that's just what they're called. Okay? So here, he's referring to men as, as lowercase g, g, gods. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. And what I'm going to show you is that a, a few times in the Bible, when it's referring to gods, it's talking about these, these mighty men rulers of the world. They are lowercase g gods. They are not deities. They are just these lowercase g gods. Verse 2 says, How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? So do these sound like good people to you that are judging unjustly and they're accepting the persons of the wicked in their judgment? No, they're, they're not good people. They're not doing what's right. So he tells them in verse 3, Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. And this is the quote, verse 6, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So are they really deities, these people who are called gods? No, he says you're going to die like men and fall like one of the princes. So when it's referring to gods here, he's not referring to a deity. They're just talking about these mighty men who are rulers who oftentimes they get puffed up in their own minds like the pharaohs of Egypt that thought they really were like a god incarnate that were ruling on this earth. And that's been going on all throughout time in different parts of the world, different cultures. They think, you know, like the, the Dalai Lama or whoever is like a god man, like, like they are like a god incarnate and that they are the, you know, the rulers of these people um, are like God in the flesh that are literally ruling their people from generation to generation. And people have believed this. So this is what he's referring to here. He says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are the children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. So Jesus says, this is what he's referring to, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods, which is what verse 6 says, I have said, ye are gods. And then he says, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came. So, in this passage, the word of God came unto these people who were called gods. So that's what he's saying. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came. Well, when this was spoken unto these people, the, the word of God came to them. They were called gods. 
and sent, it says, um, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. So, and then he says, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not, but if I do, though ye believe me not, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So, he's saying, look, these people were called gods. They were not deities, but they were called gods. But these weren't good people either. These were mighty men that, that they were judging unjustly and they accepted the persons of the wicked. Turn, if you would, to um, Exodus chapter 22. I want you to see this verse too. Because this is another verse where it's talking about gods and I believe it's talking about the rulers of, of a land or of a people, not just... Um, not just like an idol, okay? In Genesis 3, 5, this, is, this was Satan's trick. He says, for God, doth not, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, this was Satan speaking, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So, so Satan's deceit to, to Adam and Eve was that they were going to be gods, right? And, and we're going to see a negative connotation with the gods like all throughout the Bible with the little, little case G. Anything other than God the Lord um, typically has a, has a negative connotation. Exodus 22, look at verse 28. The Bible says, Thou shalt not revile the gods nor curse the ruler of thy people. And we looked, I looked this verse up earlier when we were in the study on Acts when, um, when they smote Paul because he said, thou whited wall, and, and he referred back to the law. He said, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. This is where he's getting that from, is from this scripture. He says, thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. Um, and that's why Paul then refrained himself, I, I would that you were not the high priest because of this. Um, so we see here another reference of gods, but um, as you know, in relation to like the rulers of the people like we saw here, the congregation of the mighty in Psalm 82. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're almost done. It's the last place I'll have you turn, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Chronicles 16.26 says, For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So, the gods aren't Ultimately, they're not anything more than idols. They're not more than just these figures. And you could even look at a ruler as being a figure, as being a false god, people who, who puff themselves up and think that they're gods. But um, he says, For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. 1 Corinthians 8, look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. So, this is telling us there's those that are called gods, but it doesn't mean they're literally deities. It doesn't mean that they're, they're, they are, you know, gods as in the Mormons would think, that there's gods of all these other planets and universes and everything else that are, that are deities over their dominion. Just because they're called gods doesn't make them, you know, a real god. All throughout the Bible, you'll see, and again, do the, do the study on your own. This lowercase g is usually referring to devils. It's referring to false idols and false gods. And Jesus is kind of making an interesting point here, just saying that, look, you know, these people are called gods, but, you know, you're saying that I'm blaspheming because I'm saying I'm the son of God. And um, what they should do is just believe them because he was sent from God. He had the truth of God. These other men, these other rulers and these men and these people that, that they'll have in respect are not of God. They're, they, they're, they're wicked men. Jesus was not wicked. He did everything right. And that's why I said, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. I'll finish up real quick here. Verse 39 says, Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, 
But all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. And that's kind of an, a powerful testimony to John. John preached about Jesus, right? John, and John had very little contact with Jesus during their ministries because John came first and he was preaching. The people heard him. He was preaching about Christ, preaching about the things he was going to do, preaching about the miracles because people heard this coming from John. John baptized Jesus, but nowhere in the Bible does it record them spending a lot of time together or anything like that. John baptized him, but it says that, um, and John did no miracles. He did not do anything that was a miracle. That didn't come until Jesus Christ came, but they, they bear witness. It says, all things that John spake of this man were true. John was a true prophet. He prophesied all of the things about Jesus Christ without even being a part of his ministry. And that's why when John was in prison, he said, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And Jesus answered the, you know, the people that he sent, saying, you know, the, the, the lame are healed, the blind are given their sight, and the, the, the gospel is preached unto the poor. And he's like, go and, go and tell them these things that you've seen. Because those were all the things that John was preaching about the Christ, about Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled all of that stuff. Everything that John preached about him came to pass which just proves that, that obviously John the Baptist was a prophet of God. And it says, and many believed on him there. So the influence that John had on people's lives, even after his death, even after he was beheaded, was still able to live on because of the testimony and the preaching that he did in his life. People still were, were being led to Jesus based on what he had already said. People saw, hey, this came to pass. Um, you know, all of a sudden, I think it, it, it rang even truer with them and to the point where they would believe on Jesus after it had already having the seed planted in their heart, cultivated. Now they see it. It's like, okay, this has to be of God. And they put their faith on Christ. But uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. I thank you for your words, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be good laborers for you. Lord, help us not to get sucked into this this um, home church movement that discourages um, pastors from being paid, and they, just, they, they use derogatory terms of calling them a hireling, dear Lord, and that they, um, they are against the tithe and they're against all these other things, dear Lord. But um, I pray that you would please just help us understand the truth of the Bible and um, all the truth from your word, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just help us not to get caught up in any heresies or false doctrines. Lord, we thank you so much for, for your son and the, and the great teaching that um, over and over again, Jesus Christ claimed to be the son of God in the flesh. And, and he says that, that I and my father are one, dear Lord. It's such an amazing truth. It's such a great mystery, dear Lord. But um, we love you for the, for the love that you had for us and for putting your life on the line. And uh, we thank you for your word, that you, we have your words today to follow as the good shepherd, dear Lord, that, that as your sheep, we, can, we hear your voice, dear God, and I pray that you would please just continue to lead us and to direct our paths. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.